Hey everyone, it's Grandmaster Feingold teaching the Tuesday class as per usual. Oh, wait a minute. It's my New Year's resolution to teach the Tuesday class until I don't feel like it anymore. No. Um, so there'll be 50 of me. That's, that's a lot of Feingold. Yeah. Um, today's lecture on January 7th is the Endgame lecture, and we alternate weekly between Endgame and Great Players of the Past. So we'll do end game, and since I'll never be a great player of the past, we'll look at my end games this particular lecture. Um, I've found three games that I played last decade. Anybody? No. Yeah. All right. What's funny is this: the videos take a while to get put up. This might not get put till the next. No, it'll be get put up. Yeah, pretty re pretty recently. Yeah, exactly. Karen says it's not true. Okay. Now, as you all know, do they know it, Oliver? No. Oliver's like, that's ridiculous. Um, the Pro Chess League just started yesterday, okay? And they changed the rules. By changing the rules, I'll never play again. Although if they didn't change the rules, I would also never play again. But they wanted to make double sure. And it used to be they had artificial ratings for the rules, okay? And lower-rated players love that. They go to the World Open, and they're like, I don't want to play that guy. He's too good. So they're like, all right, you play the under 1400 section. I'm like, yes, great. Okay, so low-rated players love artificially putting them in lower sections, getting huge prizes. Pro Chess League, they had a rating limit with lots of exceptions. I can actually talk about the exceptions for hours. Like, if you had a woman on your team, that was an exception. Then you, the rating didn't matter as much. And if the players were 2,700 feet or higher, they were 2,700 feet A, just like in the movie Bananas. Okay? All people under the age of 16 years old are now 16 years old. Don't sue me, Woody Allen. Okay? Like, if you're Woody Allen, you better watch your stuff. Okay, now, I played in the Pro Chess League, and one year we were the world champions with our team beating Norway in the last round, my team beat Magnus's team. I think we all beat Magnus, or maybe not. Maybe we didn't beat Magnus at all, but we beat his teammates. Anyway, so the year that we won, this is one of my games from the key match. This was the semifinals, and this was um, St. Louis when I played for them against um, the Chess Bras. And uh, after the match ended, which we won in like 12 overtimes, uh, Greg Shahadi said, wow, you did great, like to me. And I, and I responded back and I said, I lost five games in a row. And he said, no, you didn't. And I said, yes, I did. Then he looked and he went, oh, you did. But it seemed like I did well because I won my last few games, so he forgot about that. Like He forgot about losing the five in a row. Now, two of them were to Fabiano Caruana, and then one was to Le Siege, one was to Eric Hansen, and one was to Doofus. I actually know Doofus' his name. And he was about 2,200, and I hung a piece like I moved seven. Then he barely beat me. But the other people just beat me. Anyway, uh, we won the match because it was tied, and in the overtime, I decided to stop losing. And this was a key game against Le Siege again. Now, Le Siege is a funny story. He was the best player in Canada. Then he quit chess to play. Why would you quit chess to play what other game? Anybody? Go. Oh, poker. Poker. Right, the, the real answer. And I think he still plays poker, but he plays in the Pro Chess League. But I don't think he plays in the slow tournaments, just Pro Chess League. Okay, so I'm white against Le Siege, who's a better player than I am. And I'm an old man. I was born an old man. Right, Oliver? It's like you were? And as an old man... I want the slightest of advantages with no chance of losing. Now, when you look at this position, you guys think it's a draw because everything is the same. Okay, except it's not the same. Which white piece is better than which black piece? You. The rook. The rook. Everything else actually is the same. And normally, in these rook and bishop opposite color games, somebody's attacking this square. Turns out we both are. That's unusual. I'm attacking F7, he's attacking F2. So white has a slight advantage, but this is a rapid game. 
obviously this is the end of the game, so we don't have much time on our clock. Now, I've said this before in my endgame lectures, but you guys weren't listening then and you're not listening now. So I'll say it again in the next one game lecture. The reason a lot of people make mistakes in the end game isn't because they're bad at the end game. They might be bad at the end game, but that's not related. The reason is, if I asked you at what stage of the game do you have the least amount of time, it's the end game. You've already played your whole game and you've used all your time. So if I have an hour on my clock, I play okay. If I have a minute on my clock, I do not. And this is a 15 minute game, so we both have like 30 seconds here or less. So we're not gonna play very well. The other reason people play the end game badly is they're tired. We've already been thinking and thinking and thinking. The game's almost over. That's enough already. Now I'm an old man and I know all of that, so I don't let that bother me. I stay super focused and I try to win the deadest of drawn positions, although this is not dead drawn, this is better for white. Now, we just got a dog, as some of you know, like you know, okay? And when you get a dog, what's important about the dog that you get? What's the most important thing? You. That it doesn't go to the bathroom on the floor? Well, that's close. <laughs> more, more important is that it's fixed, okay? And so we got a fix over here. Got to get that fixed, okay? I want his pawn on the white square so I can take it. But he played a5, so I'm never, ever going to take it. So you guys are like, um, excuse me, why didn't you agree to a draw? Look, I lost five games in a row. I want to win one game. Give me a break. Okay, now again, I have the advantage. Now, what low-rated players do, okay, if you were in this room, you'd see lots of low-rated players who aren't me. I'm low rated compared to my opponent, but not compared to the class here, is they make one move threats, then they close their eyes and hope that it works. So a low rated player wants to play the move rook b5. Okay, what would Hakaru Nakamura say about that? Terrible. Terrible, right. Okay, if I play rook b5, he'll play bishop b4, and then that, that didn't do anything. Okay, what it did do was it took my rook off of his f pawn. Okay. So I played the move every grandmaster in the world would play here. And I'm sure all of you would play it. King g2? Yeah, king g2. Because my pawn's pinned and my king's on the back row. I don't want my pawn pinned. I want my king on the back row. Now I'm very patient. Okay, I don't do anything. And then hopefully my opponent loses on time or blunders. But I don't blunder. So that means I don't lose. However... I must have been blundering because I lost five games in a row. So this guy, I'm not going to blunder. And I've had games in my life where my opponents had one bishop, which means he's going to one color, and I put all my pieces on that color, he takes all my pieces. Not this time. Notice how these are all on white squares. You agree? And he has a dark square bishop, so he's not going to take all my pieces. When I was younger, I put him on dark squares. I was so bad when I was a little kid, even that would go to a dark square. Right, Oliver? No. He's like, what? Yeah. Okay. So he played g6. He wants to also get out of the pin, but he can't. I got two pins, one for each of you. Right? What movie? Terrible. See? It doesn't matter where his king is. He's pinned, right? Okay. The tombstone. Ah. All right. So f4. See, I move up in the world. He still can't do anything. Okay, so he plays h5 because I want to push my pawns and he can't push his pawns. That pawn can't be pushed due to it being illegal. That pawn can't be pushed because I'll take it. But if I keep pushing my pawns, eventually he'll have no moves. So I played the obvious move, h3, because I want to play g4. Okay, and I did. And he can't do anything. I was very proud of this game because normally if I beat a higher rated player, you know, they hung a queen and I won. You know? If they hang a queen, I'm going to beat them. Now, I did tell you something funny as an aside, and we're going to vote in the room. And then if you vote wrong, you guys are in trouble. You better leave the room if you vote wrong. So I'll make fun of you for like the next 40 minutes. Someone on the internet today said, I read it's an advantage if you could make two moves in a row in chess. Right? 
Obviously, they're not a very good chess player. It's sort of a silly thing to say. They said, so if a random person played Magnus Carlsen and they got to make two moves and Magnus made one every move, what would happen? And there were like 50 responses to that. Most of the responders were random people. Okay. Now, let's take Oliver. You're rated like 1,100. Yeah? If you made two moves and then Magnus made one move, then you made two moves, every move, who would win? The answer is you don't know? Yeah. Okay, what do you think? Oliver or Magnus? assume Oliver. Okay, what do you think? I don't know. Okay, so we have two I don't knows and Oliver. That's, the I don't knows have it. If this was boxing, it would be an I don't know. Right. Oliver would win every game forever. That's the biggest advantage ever. If you make two moves, you'd made him in like five moves. You, you could like take a piece and move your... You could play queen takes knight, hanging your queen and move your queen away. You get two moves. Yeah, two moves against one is anybody would win. Now, maybe somebody doesn't know the rules wouldn't win, although maybe they would, because two moves is... It's a lot of moves. Now, there is a game you've never heard of where it's king and four pawns versus everything, and you get two moves. And it's close. It's, I'm not even sure who's better there. Yeah, because two moves is good. King takes knight, move your king back. It's, it's, too, it's hard to mate a guy when he can move his king twice. you got to really control every square. And all. Okay. So anyway, the point is, he doesn't have any moves, and I have infinite moves. Okay, can this move? Nope. Can this move? No. Nope. If this bishop moves, can it ever threaten anything? Nope. This rook ever moves, he hangs his pawn. If he moves his king, he can go king here, king here. That's not the most exciting. So that's why you played G5 instead of going mm -hmm. G4, F5? That's right. Well, I'll, I'll play F5. Give me a second. Okay. So he made random legal move. And then random legal move. And then here I come. Okay. And now I'm threatening what move? If it was White's move again. G6. G6. That's easy to stop, except it's not easy to stop. That's what I meant. So remember when we started the end game, I said, why is white better? And what did Oliver say? What did he say? He said a better rook. That's right. Now I have a better rook and, and a better king. A better king. Yeah. And, and pawn's better too. But yeah, I moved my king up the board and he didn't do anything. Okay. I'm an old man. I slowly do and he can't move. So that ending was terrible for him. The position where everything looked the same, he was like, I can't lose my F-pawn, and now he's going to lose his F-pawn. So, all right. So he's like, all right, I give up. I'm going to lose my F-pawn. All right. Okay. Man, my king's better than his king. I showed him. Now, conversely, I'm like, I am winning, I'm the greatest, and I'm trash-talking. If we magically take the rooks off the board, right, there's no way to win ever. Nobody can beat anybody. He could play bishop here, bishop here forever. Okay, or anywhere. And if I, king goes to b5, he plays bishop here protecting his pawn. So even though I'm winning, i got to keep the rooks on the board. One of the reasons I'm winning is my king is good and his isn't. Now, if you were playing bug house, and this is sometimes the way I look at chess, is I try to figure out what a good bug house move is, then I make it anyway, because I'm a grandmaster, I can make any move I want. So in bug house, I want to put a queen or a rook here on the H file. That would be good, right? Okay, well I do have a rook. So if I could put my rook on the H file, that would be pretty good. Okay, so he's like, no, don't, don't do that. Okay, and I'm like, all right, I'll go to E8 then, fine. Okay, and he blundered. What should he play in this position? He, I'm threatening here. So I guess rook b8. Rook b8. Now this is the reason grandmasters blunder. Okay, if you're a low-rated player, here's how you think. I'm threatening mate. Rook b8 stops mate. 
That, that's right. A grandmaster continues thinking to his detriment. And he's like, Rick B.A., blah! Okay, also his bishop's hanging. So, I mean, so he doesn't want to play Rick B.A. Okay, he's not playing Rick, Rick B.A. It's terrible. He wants an active Rook pinning my bishop. Now, Rook B8 hangs the bishop. After Rook E7, I have this threat, and if he stops it, I take this. So I actually have to go back, and Rook B6 was a blunder, because Rook E7 wins immediately. But he was in time trouble. If he wasn't in time trouble, he wouldn't play Rook B6. But he knew if I put my Rook on the H file, I'm going to win, so that stopped that. Okay, probably he has to play Rook E8, now that I think of it. But he's clearly losing because he can't move anything. I'm up a king, I'm up a pawn, mate threats. Okay. So he played bishop f8, which is, he's a grandmaster, always play bishop f8. And now we'll, we'll ask a random student, Karen, what move did I play? Highly recommended. Um, Very recommended. The most recommended. Rookie eight. Close. I recommend this move oh, more. H7. Me. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know I played that, but I hoped I did. Yeah. Ricky Yid also winning. Man, her move also wins. No defense to that. Nothing wrong with your move. But that's me. Yeah. So what's funny is, if you look at the game quickly, or even not quickly, it looks like that was just easy win. Like that was no problem at all. He played King G7, King G, King 7 I won. And how much time was it in the clock? Oh, man, not a lot. Well, I don't know. This game was three years ago. So I don't know. But, I mean, it's very late in the game. We're exhausted because we're playing a match that's never-ending. And this game never ended. And I just lost five games in a row. Truth hurts, right? But, you know, I'm old, so i gotta got to focus, right? Nobody beats me six in a row. Nothing. Right, Oliver? He's like, I don't know, you probably lose six in a row all the time. I Ever lost six in a row? No. Okay, so I win. Go, Ben. Now, in this game, I had the black pieces, so we have to flip the board. Now, this is against everybody's favorite streamer, John Bartholomew. Okay? And I'm a grandmaster, so I played Rick Takes Queen. Okay. And... This was played in St. Louis at one of their GM tournaments. Okay, and John Bartholomew is trying to get a GM norm, and he's still trying. The truth hurts. You know what the problem with trying is, Oliver? There you go. There is my student. Actually, Spencer's student. Okay, so, yeah, he's been trying to get a norm. He's been GM strength for years, like I was. But he's trying to get geo norms. You don't see me doing that. I don't get on geo norms. Now, in this position, <clears throat> black's up in exchange. The B pawn's a goner, and the knight's not looking too healthy. If he loses his knight, the game's getting right away. Okay? But if he doesn't lose his knight, it's hard to win because everything's on the same side. And if you're playing chess, sometimes you have a bad position. It happens. And you're trying not to lose, so you want to minimize your losing chances. So Bartholomew's like, keep everything on the same side. If there's stuff on both sides, it's an easy win. And <clears throat> if you've watched my streams, you've heard me say, always sack the exchange. Okay. Unfortunately, if you get to a boring endgame and you're down the exchange, that ain't no good. But in the middle game or the opening, sacking the exchange is fine. Because... In the opening and middle game, what are the rooks doing? Not very much. In the end game, the rook's better than a knight. And I can't, look at that knight. Boo. Okay. So he played rook c3. He's not trying to save his b pawn. He's trying to save his knight. He's like, all right, I got knight c8. I got knight c6. I got rook c7. My knight is safe. Very smart from him. If he's like, I got to save my b pawn, I'll play rook e2. No, no, then your knight, no, I'm going to trap your knight, I'll play rook c5, rook c7, king f7, no, no, you no, know. that, that's no good that knight, yeah, that knight's got to get out, okay, so I'm like, well, I want your knight, he's like, no, and I'm like, all right, I'll take that, okay, so he saved his knight, and I'm up the exchange, but it's hard to win, because how do you win, 
What am I supposed to do? Okay. So I trap his knight some more. Always trap his knight. And he's like, no, I don't want my knight trapped. I'm trying to get his knight. Okay, and he escaped. I hate when he does that. I'm still trying to get his knight, and he's still escaping. But at what cost? So he escaped, but my rooks are looking good, aren't they? Also, I moved my king up the board. My king was over here doing nothing. Now my king's attacking his knight and his rook. Okay, and he has to trade rooks. That's the only move. Otherwise, double up on the bubble up. Yeah. Now they have a name for that, which I can't say because I'm a vegan. But you guys aren't vegan, so you can say it. What's this called that a vegan can't say? They're screaming it at home. They're screaming in the future. I can hear them. No, if only Spencer was here, but he's over there. No? What are rooks on the seventh rank called? You never heard of it? No. Pigs on the seventh. Uh, Have you heard that? A long time ago, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're, I can't. Uh, pigs, I. You know. Okay, so he has to trek. Right. And now, once again, obviously my rook's better than his knight, but my king's better than his king, too. Okay, so we keep making the king good. Now, let me tell you a secret. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time on the clock because, you know, we've played a million moves. So when your opponent has a knight, the knight tends to fork your pieces. However, if your pieces are on different colors, it never forks them. That would be breaking the laws of chess. Although, watching some of the games in our tournament room, I've seen some illegal knight moves. So the knights do fork pieces on different colors because the knight moves illegally. All right. But if you're playing legal moves, because we're grandmasters, well, I am. So notice how my king's on a white square and my rook's on a dark square. That means his knight will never fork me. Never. That's a good thing to understand. Knights and bishops only go to one color. That knight is on a dark square. It only goes to white squares. It's on a white square. It only goes to dark squares. So knights can't fork pieces that are on different colors. So if I put my king and rook on the same color, that's crazy talk. I've done it before. I lost, and now I don't do it anymore. Unless, you know, I forget and I lose again. Look at him retreat. That's why he's almost a grandmaster. Always retreat. Okay, and I go forward. Stop knight check. Then I check him from the front. Bam. I want to play king f3. So check him from the front. Maybe his king will move. Ah, oh, his king didn't move. Now most of you would pin, would attack the pinned piece, but the computer won't let me. Right, Oliver? Yeah. Yeah, because I'm in check. Okay. Now he can't move. Can't move his F pawn because I'll take his knight. Can't move his knight because it's illegal. If he moves his king, maybe I'll play king F3 like I wanted to play. So that's pretty happy. Okay, and I was like, well, king f3, my f pawn's hanging. Okay, so I'm like, move again, I dare you. And he did. Yay, I play king f3. I'm the best. Never give up your pawns. Now, let's vote in the room. Voting's fun. Who wants all the pawns off the board so there's no pawns? White or black? White. What do you say, Oliver? White. Yeah, white wants all the pawns off the board. So if I take this pawn and he takes my F pawn, I'm sure that's winning, but this is more winning. More pawns. Yeah, more pawns on the board. Notice I'm patient and my opponent can't move. They hate when they can't move. See how his knight can go to C2? See that? Yeah. Nope. Don't you feel bad for him? Remember how his knight was trapped on the other side of the board? Now it's trapped on that side of the board. Yeah, Oliver thought that was funny. Man, rook c6, the truth hurts. Again, weaker players make one move threats. Rook g1, knight c2, aw. Knight c2 is the only move he can make, so I stopped it. Okay, then I went here. Now, of course, I could play rook c1, knight takes, then rook c3. 
You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Which I saw, but I'm like, eh. Teach him. There's no reason to give him anything. Yeah. And now he resigned because it's his move. What's this called? He's in Zugzwang, right. If it was my move, I would have to play Rook C1 to win. Then that trick I showed you before, Knight takes and Rook back to C3. If I play Rook B3 or Rook A3, he has C2 for his Knight. But it's his move, and he, if he moves his King, he's not attacking my F1 anymore, then this just wins his Knight. So he resigned here. So again, those first two endings showed patience. I wasn't in a hurry to win. I moved my king up the board. My opponent did not. I moved my pawns up the board. My opponent did not. And the reason was they couldn't. They had a bad position. Okay, so they were in a lot of trouble. Okay, last end game, double or nothing. Against Tommy Ulrich. And I've shown this before. I've shown this in other lectures, but it's been like two, three years, right? Did you play chess three years ago? No, he's like, what's chess? Right. Okay, so Black played the obvious move. King takes D5. Yeah. And I'm up two pawns, right? So it's pawn demonium. And this game has a lot of interesting things. The most interesting thing for me, but not for you. For you, not interesting at all. But for me, the most interesting was I played way too fast here. I was like, well, this is an easy win. Also, it is an easy win. Unfortunately, there are no easy wins. And I'm like, well, I'm up two pawns. I have two pass pawns. I said, all I have to do is trade queens. Then he resigns. By the way, that's, that's correct. I was correct. Okay, so I played the trickiest move I could find. H4 confusing the people in the audience with the obvious idea of trading queens. If he takes, I check, he has one legal move. I'm good at analyzing that. And then I trade queens. Okay? And man, am I going to win this. Uh, that, that looks pretty good. And if he, like, runs back, man, that, look, that looks pretty good. Yeah. All right, so this is obviously winning. Okay. So I played h4, and he went here, and then I did it again, but I moved instantly without thinking. I do this all the time. Okay, I'm like, oh, easy win. So I played h5, threatening queen g6 mate. Good threat. If you take the pawn, queen f3 check, again. If you don't take the pawn, queen g6 mate. Man, I played h4, h5 pretty fast, considering it was a really slow game. And my opponent played the move that I missed when I played h5. Is it d5? Then I played queen g5 check and win the king and pawn ending again. I did see that. Right piece, wrong one. Pawn was right, wrong pawn. e4, that stops queen g6 check. It also stops queen f3 check. When I want to trade queens, I can't do that anymore. Now, I'm hanging my h-pawn, I can't trade queens, or I'm going to hang my b-pawn. If my queen moves to a random square, maybe he'll check me here and take my b-pawn. So after e4, I'm like, ah, ah. I pushed my h-pawn to its doom. Doom! What show? Simpsons? Futurama. Nice try. Okay. So, queen d4. And this actually saves my B-pawn, confusing the audience. They are confused. If you were here, you would, you would see the confusion. It is C4. There you go. Karen was less confused than the other people. If Queen B5 check, C4 defending my... Yeah, that's right. I like that B-pawn because it's going to Queen later. So I like that. Okay. So he took the pawn on H5. And I played C4 anyway. And I'm still winning. Just for some reason I gave my H-pawn away. That was smart. Okay. Now, that stupidity of me playing too quickly, I still do that. I'm like, 
my opponent's low rated, I'm winning, it's an easy win, and then I move instantly and it throws everything away. Then I have to win the game again, again. Because I said again, again. Yeah. Right, Oliver? Right. Okay. Now at this point, I'm like, all right, I'm being stupid again. I'm playing too fast. We're not going to do that anymore. Now comes the part of the game that you guys like. Okay? And unfortunately for Karen, hate to pick on her, but she's right here. Over the last three days on my stream, this has happened to you too often. And you know about it. But you know, you're moving in one second. What's happened to you, which has cost you from winning games, and those games became draws? Um, Stalemate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in this particular position, Black's pretty lost. So time to stalemate himself. Now, in a slow game, I know a lot about stalemate. I've stalemated myself. I've prevented stalemate. So he's playing the wrong guy. I teach stalemate. So he's got to play somebody else. Okay. And twice in this game, he tried to stalemate himself. But I'm not going to do it. Okay. So he made random legal move. I'm up two pawns again. Good, good. Move my king up the board. Always move your king up the board. Okay. And now, he played a move that confused me. I was like, that's a dumb move. And he was like, quiet. You can't talk during the game. Right, Oliver? Watch this move he played, confusing the audience. And I played the most obvious move in chess history. Right? And if you remember what I said a minute ago, which you don't, but if you did, what move did he play here? King H8. King H8. Bam! What did Run DMC say? They're screaming it at home. Give it away. That's <laughs> wrong, wrong group. <laughs> wrong, the, the, the Red Hot Chili Pepper? What is it? Yeah. No, it's tricky. T -t 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 tricky, tricky. No, you don't know? You're too young? No? You heard Run DMC? Yeah. Really? All right. So if I take his queen, it's stalemate. So is that what I did? No. no. Time to make a queen. Okay. And the game continued. A few checks. Defend all my pawns. A few more checks. A few more checks. All right. And then time to queen. All right. So I'm expecting resignation pretty soon. Pins my pawn. I go here. And I have a very obvious plan. B4, B5, B6. That looks pretty winning. He can never, ever, ever check me ever. Never. If he cheats and checks me on the back rank. Let's say his king wasn't on E8 and he played queen E8. My queen. If he doesn't check me, b4, b5, okay, looks good. Okay. He played king there, b4, and he checked me, confusing the audience. You should be confused. Yeah, and you didn't even play chess then. That's pretty good. Good job. Ah, there you go. I played this game in 2013. Were you alive then? No, no. Oh, yeah. He doesn't even know. That's how long ago it was. You were born in 2013? No. 12? Yeah. Nice. All right. Now, when he played queen e8 check, okay, he's a 2200 player. He's not, you know, not some kid from our chess camp. So you got to figure out why he's doing it. As I said earlier. Stalemate. Stalemate. Okay. Now, every move wins. Every legal move wins. All of them. Okay. But I want to win the easiest. Now, if I make a queen, which I did not, he has one legal move. What is it? King, D, King D6. Right. And now this would be stalemate. Of course, if I just check him, you know, queen c7, queen here, even give my queen away. It's not stalemate. But I, wanted, I don't want any stalemate. No stalemate. So I just made a rook. So he knew that I knew that he knew that I knew. However, you guys still don't know because it's still stalemate, which I did know. 
I just wanted there to be less stalemates. Right? See, there's different kinds of winning. You guys are like, I'm up six queens, and my friend's up two queens, so I'm more winning. And then Magnus Carlsen goes like, no, this is not more winning, it's the same. Okay? So I don't care what I'm ahead, I know I'm winning. The only way not to win is to, to die, which is more likely than, and then, and then the next likely stalemate. Okay? And I didn't die, so I won. Right? Okay. So he has two legal moves now, but that one doesn't make any sense. Take his queen with check. And after here, once again, this is stalemate. Right? Okay. So is that what I did? No. No. I played queen c7 check, and now he resigned, because now I'm going to take his queen. And after here, it's, it's not stalemate, because he has here. And if you watch my streams on Twitch, you may have noticed sometimes I have, you know, a lot of pieces under promoting and making lots of queens. And it's very rare that I stalemate somebody, even though I have like 10 seconds on my clock, because that's all I'm thinking about. If I promote, where's their legal move? I don't, I don't even look at my moves. Like, I don't have to go, hmm, B4, B5. I mean... I'm pre-moving B4, B5, B6, and I'm like, okay, is it stalemate? And then I'm like, man, this is getting tough. Especially when I have eight knights, which I did a little while ago. I'm like, yes, every move stalemate. I gotta watch it. Okay, so when I'm playing and I'm completely winning and my opponent's not resigning, which very rarely happens in a slow game, but I can show you a couple. Happens all the time on the internet when you're playing one minute and three minute. All I think about is don't stalemate, don't stalemate, don't stalemate. Conversely, when I'm losing to somebody really good, which is more likely, I'm thinking stalemate, 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 but they're not going to stalemate me. However, when it does happen in the rare occasion, and for a lot of really strong players, especially 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, they weren't playing thousands of games a week on the internet of blitz chess. They had a good excuse, though. You know what their excuse was? There, there was no internet. And he's like, what does that mean? Right? He's like, I was born in 2012. What do you mean there was no internet? So if you were a grandmaster in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, you played slow chess against other grandmasters. When you were up a queen, they resigned. You were never up a queen. Because before it happened, they resigned. Occasionally they would blunder into a stalemate because it was such a rare situation that they were so winning and people didn't resign. When you play on the internet, play a thousand games a week where I'm winning guy doesn't resign. So I'm always looking for stalemate. So in a slow game, occasionally, and I have a couple more examples which I'm not going to show today, I'm playing somebody pretty good, 22, 2500 in that range, and they're losing and they're playing for stalemate trick. And I'm like, man, you're playing the wrong guy. And they're like, quiet. Was that part of the idea when he started giving away his pawns in this game? Mm, he might have been thinking about it. I don't know. I didn't talk to him about it. But unfortunately, some coaches and some kids, when they're losing, you know, let's say an 800 is playing a 900, and, you know, the game's over. Somebody's up a queen and a rook. Then the other kid just gives all his pieces away and hopes to get stalemated. Now, obviously... If you're up a queen and a rook, and you're like, oh, I can take this pawn and this pawn and this pawn. No. You don't stalemate your opponent. Once you're up a lot of material, just go checkmate them. There's no reason to stalemate them. This guy tried twice to get stalemated. But as Oliver already pointed out, trying is the first step to failure. Right. Good job. So in those end games, you may have noticed a theme. And if you didn't, I'm going to tell you. Okay? In all three end games, which, which I won... It took me, I had to go for years and years and years to find games I won. It's a, a whole decade of, uh, how did I win? Okay, I always move my king up the board. I move my king way up the board there, right? And actually in queen and pawn endings in particular, when you're queening, which I was, moving your king up the board is the safest. Because then as I queen, my king gets protected. If my king's back here and I'm queening on the queen side, he checks me forever. So here my pawns are shielding my king as I, as I walk my king up. And in the end game, you're moving your king up 
because you're not getting checkmated. In the opening, there's only one reason you should move your king up. I've made this joke many times. What? Because, like, somebody's playing you. Correct. There's a guy who's watched my videos. You should only move your king up in the opening if you're playing me. Then, all right. And one of my favorite jokes, which happened... It's going to say which I've done. Yeah, one, exactly. One of my favorite jokes was I was teaching at the school that Archer and Holden go to, and it was strong chess class. Kids are all really good. It's not like other classes I teach. Strong class. And I said, always move your king up in the end game unless you're playing me. And then a couple of years later, I was playing a kid rated 1,000, so I was the favorite, in a slow game, and he was winning the whole game, I blundered. And at the end of the game, his king was on H8. And if he moved his king up, you know, plus 1,000, he never moved his king. And so I won. Shouldn't have won, but I did. And I thought, man, that guy was in my class, and he didn't listen to my advice. Then I realized he did. I said, don't move your king up, you're playing me. So it's, I mean, he listened to my advice exactly. So... Very suspicious, sort of like Ricky Gervais when he was dissing everybody then said, watch my TV show. So that's like, do this, but unless you're playing me, then don't do it. Okay, so in the end game, to recap, push your pass pawns like I did. Have your pieces be more active. My rook was more active. My queen was more active. My king was more active. And all of these end games, you want to have possibilities for your pieces, not defend passively. Maybe that's why he gave all his pawns away. Don't defend passively. Okay, because then that's a losing strategy. Playing aggressively, that's the winning strategy. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold here at the Chess Club and or Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Uh-huh. And next week we'll be showing the lecture, Great Players of the Past. That'll be the most fun you've ever had, showing what kind of life you've led. Bye, everybody.